and uh, Dr. Ilgen is going to take the cemented standpoint, but I've asked um, Dr. Lowry to take the non-cemented standpoint. And I'll just start by showing you just before this section started. This was the result of the poll through orthobullets on the, not all that many of you had responded, but you can see that the number of people doing a lot of cemented stems is incredibly low. Um, so, and that's no surprise. If I could just see by a show of hands, because again, not that many people did respond here, how many surgeons in the room cement more than 10 cases a year? All right, that's, that's great. Um, and how about the number of cases, how many of you cement more than 10 cases of a year excluding femoral neck fractures? Okay, about the same amount, that's great. That's more than I expected. Um, and I think that that's really, those, those two talks were super impressive to me. So I'm gonna show you guys a case. I'm gonna show you guys a case to our two um, debaters here. This is an 86 year old gentleman. He's about 18 years out of that right side. Okay, he now has uh, dementia and he presented to the hospital with this left femoral neck fracture. And why don't we just go ahead and start with you, Richard? This, this is a slam dunk, in my opinion. This is an old, demented person who uh, would benefit from cement fixation. Choose the stem that you prefer. There is a slight advantage to using a composite beam with a collar in this kind of setting, as opposed to a taper slip. So um, I probably would use a composite beam with a collar, cemented fixation. Uh, and um, he does look like he has significant arthritis as well, so I probably would do a dual mobility in terms of reduced risk of dislocation. And if I knew how to do the anterior approach, I'd do the anterior approach. <laughs> Thank you. And Charles, what, what are your thoughts on this? I, I mean, in this patient, you know, let's say you need more information, right? This is, let's say, 86-year-old male comes into a community hospital where the surgeon who's doing eight total hips a year is going to be operating on him. They don't even know where they keep the cement. They probably don't have any cement restrictors. There's no kits. The surgeon doesn't do much cementing. He's not gonna know what to ask for, right? So, um, you know, in my hands in that setting, I would do a cementless stem. I think there's emerging data that these triple taper, fully porous coated, collared stems probably mitigate a lot of that risk of the early uh, periprosthetic fracture. Um, our experience at our institution shows essentially a 0% risk a post-operative periprosthetic fracture with a specific design. Um, and then I would probably, if I was worried about the quality of the bone, put a prophylactic cable, uh, maybe two. Um, you know, the most biomechanically sound construct would be a cable above the lesser trochanter and then one below as well. Um, and I think I'd be happy leaving the OR with that. The other thing in these patients is I've gotten these in the OR planning to do cement and then anesthesia says, hey, or, you know, hurry up, the patient's blood pressure systolic is in the 80s, they don't like the anesthesia, and the last thing I want to do is put cement in there that's going to drop it anymore. Are there any medical comorbidities that would sway you away from a cemented design? In that specific scenario, I, I think the, the answer is uh, minimize bleeding, let them catch up on the volume, get their blood pressure stabilized, and I'd still cement the stem. But I would not pressurize it. I'd take, learn the lessons from the Mayo Clinic, which is every time you put a brooch down, you irrigate and suck. I, I attended a, a course in Europe about cement technique, and they're really fastidious about that. That was not part of my training, but by, by irrigating and sucking the canal in between every brooch, you can mitigate those risks. So I would basically talk to the anesthesiologist, say do what you gotta do, get control of the pressure, and I'd still cement it. Let me ask, show hands in the audience. Who would cement this femur? Okay, I just about passed out. I saw Joe Mattis' hand go up. <laughs> um, and how about uncemented? Okay, so in, you know, I, the, the talks here were super compelling. Uh, this ended up being an uncemented stem as a, a case I did very recently for reasons that um, I think that you highlighted, actually, John, you highlighted very well, time. Um, and in this patient's case, he was very, very sick, but it, I can't, it's hard for me to stand up here with my head held high after those two presentations. Um, I'm gonna move on to a, a, another case. Here is a 76-year-old woman. This woman's not demented. She is crazy AF. I mean, nuts, bilateral, severe arthritis, bilateral hip contractures, okay? These are her x-rays. 
Um, Charles, let's start with you. Do you cement this case? No, you know, for the same reasons I stated. Um, you know, on, on top of that, just to continue elaborating on the evils of cement, um, usually they like to store it somewhere where, you know, there's a window nearby and the sun only hits it for two hours a day. So like if you get to it at three o'clock in the afternoon, it sets up in five minutes. If you get to it first thing in the morning, it sets up in 15 minutes. They're going to open the high viscosity when you ask them for the low viscosity. The person on the back table has no idea how to mix it. Um, you know, if I'm worried about the bone quality, same thing, you know, stem like an actus or avenir complete type polar stem and then uh, put a cable on it if I'm worried about the bone quality. Okay, and Richard? I think it's, it's a very similar situation to the last case. I think what we're really talking about is a training problem and a lack of use problem. And if those are solvable problems in my view, that means we got to teach more people how to use cement properly, get our team in the OR up to speed. But if you do that, cement technique's pretty straightforward. That's a great point. Are there any um, of our um, industry um, consultants here that um, can help me with this question? I, I'm curious why we don't have cement courses. Courses for fractures, courses for the anterior approach with cementing technique as part of it. I, and I think that's exactly right. There's not, the money's not there, but I think the money might be there. I think it's something that we as a community should come together and say, hey, listen, we need to learn how to do this better. We need to train people better how to do this. The data is clear. And I think that is part of the reason we're, we're not using cement very often. All right, well, listen, this lady, like I said, nuts and living low to the ground. She fell out of her trailer before her surgery day and showed up in the hospital now. And it is hard to see this fracture, but she has a spiral fracture of the femoral shaft now. My partner was on call. He said, hey, I'm going to nail this. Do you, but she said she wants you to be her doctor, which by the way, huge problem, which we'll talk about more tomorrow. There is no way that we should be doing intramedullary nails for patients with preexistent hip arthritis in the setting of fracture. I'll just say that as a statement right now, in my opinion. Now, now that we've got a fracture, let me ask you, are you, are you changing your tune as far as stem design here? This changes the game in my view. Um, it's a really hard problem because you've got clearly Dorsey canal. Now you've got a spiral fracture. You've got a Paprosky type four now because uh, it's below the isthmus. So you're gonna have your hands full dealing with um, how to put that back together. Now it doesn't look terribly displaced, at least not yet. Um, so you might get away with a circlage cable in place and convert a type four into more of a type 3A where you got plenty of room to work with approximately. Uh, and then I would do a, um, I, I, in these more complex situations, I would use a, a modular, a fully porous coated, probably spline taper design. Is there a concern about using cement in the setting of a fracture? as to the healing of the fracture? I know there used to be, and I do very little of this work anymore. So there's a series of papers out of Exeter, England that look at specifically treating periprosthetic fractures with cement and cement technique. It can be done. Uh, they don't worry that much. About, I, first of all, the data is limited, mm -hmm. so I can't sure. answer the question definitively, but they do it fairly frequently, and they have a decent amount of preliminary data to suggest that even if cement oozes out of the fracture site, it's a good way to fix the fracture. It's by no means, I, I don't think it's universally agreed upon that that's the right way to go, and in the United States, I think the majority of people will probably use cementless fixation. You brought up the good point. It's, it's not significantly displaced yet, but once you start manipulating this femur, especially in my case where I'm doing this through an anterior approach, I might displace that further. I thought about doing this with cables, but I did end up using instead a percutaneous plate fixation to really, and this, and thank you, Dr. Maddie, for helping me think through this case in advance. I think there's a lot to be said for camaraderie of the, of the people in this room that can help you with difficult problems and questions as you proceeded for the residents and fellows in the room down your career through your learning stage. I'm 19 years into this and I'm still calling Joel with frequency, hey, what should I do with this one? Um, in this case, I decided for a very robust fixation of that femoral shaft and then with a not full length, but in this pretty short lady, relatively longer, uh, um, a fully porous coated implant. Um, so I don't think we have much more time for any more cases, um, but I would like to thank you all for your presentations as we now move into a panel discussion regarding all of the um, 
discussions you've seen here today.